Hello. Welcome to the Producers Guild conversation with the creative team behind The Little Things. We'd like to thank our friends at Warner Brothers Pictures and Strategy PR for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today. Pete Hammond is currently Chief Film Critic for Deadline Hollywood. For the past 10 years, he has also been awards editor and columnist for Deadline. He served as film critic for Box Office Magazine, Backstage Magazine, Hollywood.com, Movie Line, and for Maxim Magazine for three years, and was a frequent contributor to Variety. Welcome, Pete. Welcome, panelists. Thank you all for being here. And please, Pete, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Kyle. And uh, welcome to this panel here for the uh, new film, The Little Things. Uh, from Warner Brothers. Very happy to do this. This is a terrific film, and uh, I think you can tell from uh, probably having seen it. Uh, and look at what we have here. Uh, as, as Kyle said, the creative uh, team in many ways here. Let me start uh, by introducing them. First up, Academy Award-winning producer. So many movies, I'm not going to name them all, Mark, but uh, <laughs> he works all the time uh, in this business, and this is his latest, and he's worked a long time on this one. This is Mark Johnson. Hi, Mark. Hi, thank you, Pete. And uh, we have uh, the writer, director, and producer uh, of the film here. He also has done a lot of great movies, and um, uh, I want to introduce him as well. That's John Lee Hancock. Hi, John. Hi, Pete. Thanks for doing this. Oh, happy to do it. And uh, we're uh, fortunate enough to have a member of the uh, cast, one of the three uh, main stars of the film here. He also is an Academy Award winning uh, actor, many, many uh, roles that you've seen him in. Uh, and his latest, Albert Sparmo, right here in The Little Things. This is Jared Leto. Hi, Jared. Hey, Pete. Thank you. Hey. And uh, so, uh, you know, this begs the question. It takes a long time to get movies made in this business, apparently. <laughs> and uh, this movie is an example of it. Uh, John, let me start with you. As the writer here, how this came about initially, and it was about three decades ago. Yeah, um, I don't remember exactly, I, mean, I, can't go back, I can't go back and look at emails or anything to see, uh, you know, uh, when I pass the script along to people, but uh, my re recollection was it was around 1992. I had a, um, a script that uh, was sent into the, registered with the Writers Guild in March of 93, I believe. So that tells me I probably wrote it in 92, 93. I don't remember why I wrote it. It was an original idea. Um, I was living in, in Hollywood uh, in, a, in a crappy apartment. And so I was just kind of looking out the window at what I was seeing. I was always a big fan of uh, crime dramas and, 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 and movies like that. Um, but I also felt that um, a lot of the movies, especially from the eighties, I think that had cops chasing killers were more interesting in the first two acts than they were in the third. Uh, the first two acts being the clues and the misdirection and trying to figure things out. And then in the third act, the bad guy would be identified and there would usually be some kind of a, uh, uh, you know, action set piece and in a, in a big shootout or something like that before the good guy kills the bad guy. And uh, I, I wanted to try something different where it kind of unraveled in a satisfactory way instead of building to uh, a, you know, a, a very kind of mathematical climax, something that was surprising and different and uh, hopefully satisfying. Well, that worked out. Why did it, uh, you were not going to direct it actually when you wrote this, this was before you started directing a lot. Right, this was, um, I'd, I'd just written um, A Perfect World uh, that Mark produced for Clint Eastwood and it came out in 93, I believe. Um, fall of 93. So yes, I was writing for other people. And uh, this was originally part of a blind picture deal with the Warner Brothers and Steven Spielberg. And I, when I outlined the piece and sent him a long, a long outline, pretty detailed, he really liked it, but said it was just too dark for him. He was doing um, Schindler's List at the time, and I, I don't think was ready to go to that dark place again. Um, there were several other directors along the way. Uh, you know, there were 
almost detached. Forgive the uh, fire engine behind me. Uh, but, uh, you know, we went through several different directors that were interested. And then when I started directing, Mark came to me and said, what about the little things? And um, it was just, it was such a dark piece. And I had little children and I, I decided I didn't want to live in that world for two years. So every few years, Mark would ask again. And, uh, and then my kids went off to college and Mark asked again. And I went back and reread it. And um, had, I had some good friends that were screenwriters who were fans of the script and encouraged me uh, to do it. Scott Frank and Brian Helglin were big fans of the script and said I was an idiot if I didn't direct it. So I went back and, and reread it and liked it a lot. And then, you know, overnight sensation, overnight story, 30 years in the making, you know, Warner Brothers said yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Mark, you really have to have tenacity to stick with these things, you know, like you do and keep going when you believe in a project. This is the life of a producer. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a textbook example. Uh, of that. It, it it gives real validation to what we do. And some of the movies that I've produced, the ones I'm proudest of, things like Donnie Brasco and The Little Princess and so on, took years and years to put together. So, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't hard. I, I, I always believed in this and knew we would make it at some point. I wouldn't, to be honest, I wasn't sure that John would direct it, but I wanted him to. So I would go to him every, um, you know, as John says, every couple of years. And at first, I think it was, it's a, you know, it's a darker movie. And it, 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 was, it was a great experience making this movie. I wouldn't say it was any fun. And you know, movie making can be fun. But this one was, you know, it, it's, it's very intense and very deliberate. And you, you just, you have to be in a particular place. And, and John... Uh, you know, I, I think it takes John full circle back to where we started, which was a perfect world, which is also a very serious, a serious piece. And, uh, you know, he and I went on and, and uh, I, I produced the first movie he, he directed, The Rookie, which is, you know, completely different tonally. But yeah, I think it gives me great hope because there are, you know, several things on on my shelf that I just have patience with and know that someday uh, we'll get around to making. Uh, well, you, this will give you hope, <laughs> no doubt about that. Um, why, maybe this was a nice accident that it took all this time? Cause this movie seems very right uh, for now. Do you think that Mark, that maybe all this time that it's a better movie coming out now than, and being made now? Unquestionably. I, first of all, I think we have the perfect cast. And I think that this cast would have been, I mean, is more perfect than had we cast it 20 some odd years ago and whoever was right then. It just, it's the confluence of so many things coming together at the right time and you're right tonally. And um, it's, you know, it's a very, a very intense, um, picture of what it might be, what we can assume might be the life of a, of a cop, of a homicide cop and, and, and a detective and an and exploration of that world. And I, and I think that world is so much more comp com complicated and even compromised today. So I think, I really do believe that we, we have, even though it's a peer, slightly a period movie, I think it's more relevant today than it would have been 15 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned the cast, who we have a member of it here, Jared Leto. You have Denzel Washington, you have Rami Malek, and you have Jared Leto. You have three Oscar-winning actors in this. And, um, you know, that's impressive right now to be able to do that. Jared, let me ask you, when you got this script, you know, knowing the history of it and everything else, what attracted you to playing this? Because after you've won your Oscar, you've been very, and even before, you're very, very um, picky about the kinds of roles you want to do. You really are dedicated to a role once you do it. So what about this one? Well, these two guys were, were a great reason to do it. I had watched the founder um, and was just blown away by it. I thought it was such a beautifully made movie. 
uh, great performances, just so well directed uh, and shot. Uh, I think I actually chased John down after I, John Lee Hancock down after I saw that movie. Um, and we met and, 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 and hit it off. And I think when I initially read this, I wasn't sure it was for me, uh, but after talking with John Lee for, for a while, um, I just thought there was an opportunity here to do something absolutely crazy. Uh, and uh, it's something that I hadn't done before. And, and, and I was really excited about building uh, this, this, you know, really complicated um, character from the ground up. I mean, uh, right from the name, Albert Sparma, you know, it, you're, you're, you're ready to spend time with someone who's a little bit different. Yeah, it is different. And the um, the interactions that he has, this whole cat and mouse game, it is so not typical. You don't know what's going to happen in this movie. As John alluded to, this does not follow the formula, which is a very successful formula for these kinds of films. But this one dares to veer off the path, I think. And, and particularly in regards to your character here, he's not a stereotyped uh, kind in, the, in this genre. Yeah, I think it's 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 a classic American crime thriller that subverts the genre and really takes you to some place new. It, it's the type of film that makes you ask a lot of questions rather than just giving answers. And I quite like that. I mean, you know, we talked at great length. Um, uh, you know, asking each other questions. How did Albert know this? How did he figure this out? Why was he here? And it really kept me on my toes the whole time. Uh, not just, you know, building the character or getting on set with a performance, but really trying to understand, you know, how and why things were, were happening. Yeah, John, okay, dream cast, this clearly is, you know. Uh, you, you don't write, I don't think, you know, all those years ago, obviously, with this cast in mind, do you did you have other people in mind when you originally wrote this or did you just write the characters straight through? Um, no, especially with something original that I'm making up. I just try to create complicated whole characters. I, I think that some people might write two actors, but to me, it just kind of in some ways inhibits um, you know, my creative impulses about what a character should be and ways to make um, them different. Um, I, you know, I've had I've had actors tell me before, you know, years back when you give them a script, they said it, it feels like you wrote this for me, and that's not a good thing. I've already done that. I want to do something different. So, um, so no, I didn't have anyone in mind, but I, I, but I couldn't I couldn't have imagined then, and it's hard for me to imagine the reality of it now of having having these three in these roles. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, talk about. Uh, working here with Denzel Washington uh, in a very interesting role here, uh, you know, and Rami Malek, who I wouldn't have thought of necessarily in this role either, you know, in, in the casting of it. Why that work? Why this worked so well? Well, and for me, these are three really complicated, interesting, and different people. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> and uh when Den Denzel came on first and thinking about someone that was very different than Denzel because as Jared said this kind of subverts the genre but it also embraces it in some ways until you figure out what the movie is really about um so I wanted someone that that didn't feel like they would be the person who would go have a beer and watch uh, Monday Night Football with, with Joe Deacon. I wanted two very different people. And uh, Jim Baxter is more buttoned up. He probably has the biggest journey from the start of the movie to the end, uh, personal journey. So thinking about that and thinking about great actors, uh, you know, we all talked about it, Mark and Denzel and myself, and we we, you know, arrived at Rami and then crossed our fingers that he would respond to it, and uh, and he did. And then, and then Jared came on after, and uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where you go, wow, this is an amazing cast, and you're really really excited, and then 
you wake up in the middle of the night with a cold sweat saying, oh, now it's on me to try to make sure this works. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, talk about John Lee uh, Hancock as a director, Jared, you know, and and uh, the way uh, you guys all worked with him uh, in this in this film. Um, he's a total nightmare. Very complicated. <laughs> uh, uh, no, he's fantastic. And, you know, the, these two make a, a really great team. They are so experienced and you know, I think the old cliche that experience doesn't amount to much is, is just absolute bullshit because uh, it, it's quite nice when people have a lot of experience and uh, especially on a set when, you know, we all know what that could be like. So jo John Lee Hancock gives you that wonderful and rare gift. Um, when you walk onto his set as an actor, you know that no matter what you're going to be taken care of. So you can walk on the set and fail. And I think that's really important. You know, you can, you can fail 10 times or let's say fail six times. And on the seventh time it works. Uh, and, and that's all you need. All you need is one. Um, so J John is, is just a, a, a treasure um, for, for actors as a real actors director. And uh, just the joy to work with. I mean, I found him to be really collaborative, really, you know, I think he feels like he probably made, makes the big decision uh, with who he's casting. And then he trusts his actors to, you know, do the work and meet him halfway and dive in deep and, you know, uh, you know uh, show up ready to, to, to rumble. Um, and that's exactly what we did here. Yeah, and, and in creating your character too, I've talked to you before about this, but you you go through a lot in, in getting the physicality, the exact look. I, I think you ran through, how many wigs did you try before you came up on this? <laughs> you know, let, let, let me interrupt for a second, Pete. Uh, it was such a, a surprise and, and a real pleasure to watch Jared build or discover this character. You know, when I first met him, we were the equivalent of hanging, hanging out. And then he would try different, different aspects and try different voices. And you saw a, an actor truly build and discover this character. And then once we started shooting, that was kind of the Jared I knew, and not, and I didn't really re-meet the guy I started the, started the movie with until uh, his last day of filming. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Jared, what do you think about that? <laughs> um, well, it, it, you know, that was the, that's the gig here. Um, it, we really did talk about from the very beginning, you know, how far could we walk towards that line and, and not cross it. But I was really interested in pushing things uh, and being as transformative as possible. Um, and I really enjoy that process. I mean, that process of discovery is like maybe the most exciting part of all of it to me. And, you know, Albert Sparma, there was a walk and a talk and a prosthetics and, you know, different eye color and teeth and, you know, we did try on, uh, you know, dozens of wigs. I think at one point we were trying to find the worst wig in all of Hollywood, which is <laughs> probably a hard thing to do. Um, <laughs> but that we did find some that were so good, I, I, I kept them for future use. So if you see me in a, in a very questionable wig and, and, and you know, the little things part two, you know where it came from. But I, I, I just, I'm interested in transformation and, and, and working really hard. It seems I'm just a big believer in, in, in the more risk, the more reward, I suppose. I learned so much about Albert Sparma who you know, I supposedly created by spending a lot of time with Jared, going to Jared's house and seeing all the work product that went into this transformation from, you know, he would listen to thousands of hours of tapes, uh, people with different criminal maladies and things like that. Uh, the, the voices, um, stuff all over the walls, um, 
I hope I'm not sharing too much, uh, you know, about your process, Jared. But it was. I just want to say that going into this Sparman Museum at your house was uh, <laughs> was uh, was transformative for me as well. Yeah, I almost forgot about that. We had the the walls covered. Uh, I mean, we 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 dove in pretty deep, and like I said before, for me, it's just the most enjoyable part of it. Although I have to say, on this film, a funny thing did happen. Is usually the prep is the most enjoyable, but on this film, I actually had, you know, once the camera started rolling, I really had. It was quite exciting and, and terrifying because, you know. He was the type of guy where his behavior was appropriate no matter what he did, you know, because he was such a made such strange choices. So that really kept me on my toes, and um, it was it was quite daunting but exciting at the same time. You know, Mark, Thank I you. have to ask you. You know, certainly Warner Brothers, who you did this film with. Uh, if, if there's any studio that has a great history of crime and, and, and in this genre, it's Warner Brothers um, throughout their entire history. Um, mm. But big studios now are into superheroes and things. It's very hard to get these kinds of original movies made now. How difficult was it uh, from the studio point of view of getting this made? Well... You know, Warner Brothers, I have to say, I give them great credit and I give the studio great credit because over the years, different executives would call me and say, hey, we were just reread the little things. What do you think? You guys want to make it? And uh, for one reason or another, we weren't able, able to do it. The truth of the matter in today's world and the, the, the movies that the big studios are making, they're, they are not usually things like the little things. And quite frankly, I believe... They obviously believed in, in, in John Lee and, and they had, had a history with me, but I think it was Denzel and Rami and, and Jared who actually got the movie made at Warner Brothers. That's what it, that's what it took ultimately, uh, yes. putting this, this cast together. And yes. that's as part of producing, that's always a, a, a big trick of getting that right cast, getting them all available and getting it made here. There's another member of the cast I want to talk about that comes into the financing and everything, and that's Los Angeles itself, and, uh, and shooting in, uh, in, in LA, a different part of LA too, um, that John Lee Hancock, <laughs> you know, kind of the back alleys here. Um, did that add to the expense here of shooting in LA? You, you don't always get to shoot movies here in your backyard. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's very seldom. It's so, so seldom that we get to make, make movies here. A lot of television shows shoot here, and that's actually the bane of our, uh, our creative existence because the city is so well known, you know? <laughs> and every now and then you'll have a location manager and you'll come across a, the perfect location and he say, yeah, we were here six months ago on, uh, and I mentioned a show, and you, you can see right, right where we put the uh, dolly. And, and then you immediately say, oh, no, now we can't shoot here. <laughs> but it, it's hard. Um, you know, there, there are people every now and then you'll see a filmmaker and she or he will, will reveal Los Angeles in a way you've never seen it before. You know, I was always uh, impressed with what Michael Mann did. It somehow he, he delivered a, uh, you know, a, a Los Angeles that uh, I'd never quite seen before. And I think the, you know, the drill that, that John Lee gave our production designer, Michael Cornbluth and, and location manager is, you know, we got to come up with, with a Los Angeles that hasn't been seen before that is both, both Los Angeles, almost, but not quite iconically Los Angeles. But so we've got to know that it is this city but I don't want to have seen it before. I remember, yeah. I remember Michael. I remember Michael saying um, he wanted to make sure that every single location didn't look like anything we could find in Louisiana or Georgia. That was the first bar. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, it. How important was that though for you in writing this and to to show that John, you know, to to show something that we haven't seen before. And I'm from LA and I hadn't seen a lot of it before. I can guarantee yeah, it, that. it was very important. Mark Mark reminded me early on in prep that Los Angeles is the most photographed city in the world. So good luck finding, you know, stuff. But um, 
some of the neighborhoods uh, that I envisioned when I wrote it are now so gentrified that you wouldn't shoot there. I think the, the, my, my flop house was an actual flop house and I believe now it's a Whole Foods or something. So we had to, we had to expand our reach you know, further into East LA, further north into the valley, into Sun Valley, um, finding spots of LA that are absolutely LA, but just not photographed and not seen and not part of the kind of glamor of Los Angeles or the dream of Hollywood. Yeah, and another uh, problem that came for you in this script was technology. From the time you had originally written it has changed considerably. And so I guess if you were, were you ever thinking of just making it set in, in now, even though you wrote it in, in the 90s? Or, you know, were you forced really to keep it in that period because of the change of, of, of technology? Well, it's an interesting one because, um, you know, when I, when I wrote it, it was a contemporary piece and now it's a period piece um, without any changes to it. Uh, <laughs> and when I wrote it, um, I, was, I was interested in it because it was, and I spent a, a, lot, a lot of time with one particular sheriff's homicide detective, Stanley White. And uh, I was really taken by how hard the work is when you don't have cell phones. This is pre-DNA. Um, where you have to stake out uh, in a car. These guys work so hard. And so when Mark and I talked about, do we make it contemporary? Because by the way, that would save us money. Um, you don't have to replace a bunch of stuff. Um, but we decided that 1990, because of the rigor and burden it placed on the cops would be the time to do it. Yeah. Um, Mark, uh, what, uh, I know you don't like talk budgets and things, but how do you do a picture like this uh, and bring it in, you know, for a price that the studio is willing to go with? Um, it's, a, it's a good question and not one that I'm, I'm really comfortable to answer, answering. First of all, I never like to talk about budgets, you know, I always, I'm, I'm always hoping that the audience is going to say, oh, it you know, looks very expensive, but don't really know what it, what it costs. Um, yeah, it was a tight budget. You know, we, we it's it's look, it's a big high profile movie. We've got three extraordinary actors who are, you know, well known and 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 bring with them a whole, you know, expectation from an audience and but but the film itself was actually a you know, a, a relatively small budget and we had to be incredibly imaginative and um, you know, we it was Difficult. It was difficult because once again, because the fact that Los Angeles is so overexposed and so, been shot all the time, everybody is looking for a lot more money. Look, if you want to rent a house to shoot in for a day in Los Angeles, it's probably going to cost you. I mean, I'm not joking. Four or five times what it would cost you if you were in Atlanta or somewhere in Louisiana. And so you once again, you just got to be really imaginative and and. And John Lee was very understanding so that there were certain things we couldn't afford. And, and we, you know, once again, it's, uh, you know, necessity, uh, uh, you know, it's it being the you know, mother invention. We, the movie benefited from, I think, our the financial handcuffs. Ah, see, there, that's, uh, that's a plus right there. Yeah, in being inventive <laughs> yeah. in the whole thing, yeah. Um, you know, we've talked about these actors so much, but I have to ask Jared, the opportunity to work opposite, like in this kind of uh, script, uh, opposite Denzel Washington, who I have to tell you, it, it's saying a lot, but he is so great in so many things. I think this is one of the best things I've ever seen him do. And, uh, and Rami Malek too, that extraordinary scene where you're trying to get him to get in the car with you, Jared, which is like, <laughs> the audience is going like, what? You're gonna get in and let the uh, <laughs> this guy you suspect of being a serial killer drive you somewhere? <laughs> Talk about working opposite those two actors here. Well, uh, let's start with uh, Denzel Washington, who, I mean, I keep saying this, someone's gonna to cut together a montage of me like the, the Lady Gaga one. <laughs> but uh, I keep saying that, but for me, Denzel is like Brando and, and Beethoven wrapped up into one. He's, he's, it doesn't get any better than that. And you know what I love so much about Denzel is how much he puts into every performance of his, his 
heart, his soul, his intelligence, you know, his physicality. Um, I, I think we'd all be hard pressed to find a performance, um, a bad performance uh, in his entire career. I can't think of one. Um, even if a movie doesn't work, you know that he's always solid. He carries films, he elevates films. And I think it's just, he, he's a rare example of, how, of what a career can be in this business. And I just, you know, I've always wanted to uh, work with him. I was happy just to be a fan and be in the audience and enjoy his work, but to stand on a set uh, and, 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 and kind of, uh, you know, be in the presence of greatness uh, in that way was, was quite an extraordinary gift. It's absolutely a masterclass in acting um, and, uh, you know, just incredibly inspiring. I knew from the very first moment that um, we had a very small interaction that it, it was on, that was, it was, it was gonna be, uh, it was gonna be a fun one. Uh, and I just learned a lot. I learned a lot. I remember the first time I caught his eye and I think I said something in the interrogation scene. I said something kind of, you know, a smart ass comment that that Albert would say. And of course, as, you know, a, a, an actor, I was going to say a young actor, but I guess a youngish actor, you know, the first time you throw an ad lib uh, Denzel's way, you're like kind of <laughs> waiting for him. You know, you don't know what to expect, uh, you know, uh, but he surprised me in a way that I hadn't been surprised. I don't think ever in his response. I don't. I don't, I don't know if it's in the film. I. I, I doubt it. Um, but his response was so. Then I I, I. I guess I expected a detective to respond in a kind of gruff, tough way and shut me down, the character down. But he actually smiled and was so charming. Uh, and laughed with me. It was just, uh, it was a beautiful moment. And I was really, really proud um, to be working with him um, and excited. And Rami is just, you know, he's a killer. He's, uh, no pun intended, but he's just, you know, the upstart, um, even though he's been doing it for a while, he's just, you know, uh, a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, both of these guys, I appreciate their faith in me and their patience and their generosity. Um, that, that was a really beautiful gift they gave me. Yeah, well, you know, this movie, um, uh, to be able to see it now, I, you know, I, I always wonder about all those scripts out there, those great scripts that didn't get made that could have been great movies. And you think, wow, it's that easy to, to uh, have them passed over. I'm so glad Mark, that you were so tenacious, and John Lee Hancock, you decided that this was a good script you had written <laughs> and worth doing, and that you put this cast together to make the little things. And I thank you all for uh, joining us uh, today to talk about it here for the for the producers guild. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much, Pete. Appreciate it, and uh, thanks to uh, both of you guys for the job. I appreciate it. <laughs> We'll do it again sometime. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Pete. Thanks. Appreciate it. So long. All right. Thanks, guys.